Well, good morning again. Good morning. It is a good morning. Good morning. Yeah, there it is. I like that. It's okay to have a good morning. Should be having a good morning if we're here together. Should hopefully make our morning better to be gathered together in his name. We're going to let our children slip out the back at Children's Church. I know they were waiting patiently for that. There they go. Off like a rocket. Back there with Miss Jackie. Yep, she's got them. May have to snatch a couple of them bald. There we go. Okay, so children, that's basically ages 4th through 5th grade. If you're a guest, if you got kiddos with you, they are more than welcome to be a part of Children's Church. We'll be back there in our children's area. There they go. All right. So for the rest of us, we are going to be back in the book of 2 Peter. So start heading that direction, if you would, the book of 2 Peter. If you've got the app, there should be some notes available on that. And by the way, if, if you're having issues with the app, so we're running into this a week or two ago where um, not everyone's version of the app was updating and things seem to be behind. So uh, if you have issues with that, if you'll let me know, I will smile and nod my head like I know what you're talking about. And then I'll go talk to the people who actually made the app and figure out what's going on. But uh, So if you ever have issues, please let me know. We want to make sure that that app is user friendly and uh, if at all possible, as many people can be taking advantage of that. But if you don't have your app, you can grab your bulletin, maybe write some notes down there as well. Our goal for today, and our goal for next week, is to finish up this book of Second Peter. So we've made our way all the way through these, these letters from Peter, hashtagging our way as we go. Again, why hashtag? Well, hashtag is, is something short and sweet, but it connects and hopefully makes a point, gives you something to ponder. And I believe that's how Peter writes these letters, right? He's, he's very to the point. Uh, he's direct, but he's also giving us some very deep things to ponder, consider, and process as well. And so we just finished 2 Peter chapter 2 uh, last week, took it as one big chunk, uh, basically a, a scathing review of false teachers, uh, false gospels, right, false, false disciplines, and okay, more importantly, maybe for us, the fools that believe and follow them, right? So we have to be careful of false teachers. We have to be careful of these false gospels. And we ourselves cannot be led astray by what is untrue, right? Peter has nothing good to say about those false teachers, those false gospels, and the fools that follow them. In fact, he talks a lot about punishment and condemnation and judgment and things like that. Because if you choose to follow things that are untrue, Right? You will pay the consequences. It's in direct contrast to chapter 1. Chapter 1, we started out, he gave us the, the whole point of the, of the letter really right off the bat. It's the word knowledge. You guys remember that? Talked about knowing who God is, having a right knowledge and understanding of who God is. And, and really, all the way back to 1 Peter, he talked a lot about who we are in him and through him and what that means. But in 2 Peter, he's talking about knowledge. He's talking about growing. He's talking about wisdom, which is the, the just application of of that knowledge. That is Peter's desire for the church is not to get distracted, right? Not, not to find something else shiny in the world or even inside the church that would take them away from the true gospel, but to focus on the word of God, dig deep into it, grow in knowledge, grow in all those things you talk about perseverance and self-control and brotherly kindness and all these things we've talked about and really mature and produce fruit and be the kind of person that God has made you to be. He wants you to grow. He wants you to mature and not to get sidetracked. Peter, I believe, is very practical. right? So he's going to tell you, this is what you got to do. This is what you're called to do. This is what you don't do. And this is who you don't follow. right? He's going to do that again, I believe, today and this morning as we get into chapter 3. He's going to kind of connect what we've talked about in chapters 1 and 2 right, with a new concept that's uh, really it's something that's it's universal. It's going to affect everyone inside the church, outside the church, right? But it does have kind of maybe some, some special warnings and implications for us spiritually as well. So he's going to tie it back to a little bit to what happened in chapter 2 with the false teachers and the false gospels. And he's going to move forward to the greatest hope that every Christian should have. Now, before we get there, I thought we should start off this morning uh, with a little riddle. You guys like riddles? Okay, so to introduce our concept for this morning, I've got a riddle for you. Everyone's brain and, and thinking caps engaged here. Okay, so what is free but priceless, right? You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, right, but you can spend it. And once you've lost it, you can never get it back. 
Anybody know what that is? Time. Heard that a few, few people said that. Time. Time is free. Right? I mean, you woke up this morning, so you're living, you know, on time. Some people say borrowed time, but you're, you're here. You're alive. You're functional. Okay? And, and we've got some of it, but it's priceless. Okay? You can't own it. Right? You can't do anything to stop time or manipulate time. It's not yours to do with as you will necessarily, right? But you can use it, take advantage of it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it, right? And once you've lost it, you can never get it back. And lost time is one of the, seems like the biggest regrets that people often talk about. Oh, the time that I've lost, right? The time that, that uh, got away from me. Didn't, didn't accomplish or do what I wanted to do. And so what Peter's going to do as he transitions into chapter 3 uh, I think Peter's going to give us uh, start with a warning. He's good about this, right? He's going to talk about this concept of time. He's going to tie it back to chapters 2 and chapters 1 there, right? He's going to start off with kind of a, a warning about time, right? Because the truth is time, and that word time, it seems simple. It, it seems like, hey, we, you know, we all know about time. We all talk about time. We all experience time. But time is really a rather intimidating word. And there are people who can use time to rob us of things. Right? There are people who know how to manipulate us when it comes to this concept of time, and it's very dangerous, both for just people in general right, and in the world and the culture today, but also specifically for us inside the church. So he wants to give us the right perspective on time, because that's going to help give us, again, the right perspective and focus on growth, and it's going to help us keep track and keep focused on truth as well. And so we are going to talk this morning about time. Our hashtags are going to deal with that. And so let's jump right in. Second Peter chapter 3. Okay, and let's talk about how time is money. Who's heard that phrase? Time is money. Anyone guilty of using that phrase? Time is money. All right. We know where that phrase came from. Who, who gets credit for coming up with that phrase? Anyone know? I think I told some guys at the men's dinner. According to the internet... Okay, of course, on the internet, it's got to be true. Benjamin Franklin came up with that phrase, right? And all his, his wisdom, and he was thinking about this growing nation of America and all these different things it was beginning to accomplish and all the different kind of wealth and power it was beginning uh, to, to kind of consolidate and pull together. Coined the phrase money, or our time, sorry, is money. Time is worth something. Time is valuable, okay? And so let's look at maybe how that applies with what Peter is telling us, again, from chapter 3. So let's go ahead. We're going to read the first seven verses, and we'll go back through, and we'll pick them apart this morning. And so 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. For the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. All right, so what's going on? What is Peter introducing here? Well, first, Peter's going to go back to his, his, his kind of standard mode of operation. Peter's already told us before in the second letter that you know, he's, he's writing about knowledge. He wants us to have the right knowledge. And the goal is that he would what? Be constantly reminding us of these things. That is growing in knowledge through the right knowledge of God, maturing, producing fruit. And my goal is to keep reminding you to walk faithfully in and through Christ. So I'm going to keep telling you things that will help you do this, right? You see that beginning there in chapter 3, right? I write this to you so you can have pure minds. I write this to you as a reminder. When you look at some of these words in verse 2, right? This you may be mindful of these words. The word mindful in, in Greek may, means to have a sincere mind, right? Pure thoughts to, to be pursuing 
truth. If you look at this and you take it a step back from Greek back into the Latin, the word sincere uh, means sign Sarah. That's the Latin. Probably not saying that right. But it means without wax. Okay, so to be sincere means you are without wax. Now, what does that mean? Well, back in the day, if you were in the pottery business, right, and you had a piece of pottery that was cracked and you weren't a person of maybe reputable character, you would take that piece of pottery, you would fill in the crack with wax, and you would paint over it so that the piece of pottery looked whole. It looked good. Right? It looked like it had no imperfections. But there's a way that you could tell... Right? If that pottery had wax in it, you could hold it up to a light source like the sun. And if there was any part of that pottery where you could see light coming through, you knew that that pottery was not what it seemed. That on the outside it may have looked good and whole. The person maybe even was selling it as a good, whole, usable piece of pottery. But in fact, it was patched with wax and that wax patch wouldn't hold. Right? Eventually it would give out and you'd have a hole in whatever piece of pottery that you have. It was a test, right? It was an opportunity to be either made whole and pure or to see that there is something lacking or wrong. Okay? And Peter says, listen, I want you to be whole. I want you to be sincere. I don't want there to be cracks in your faith or your theology so that people can come in and use that to their advantage against you. So as we go through this word, as we go through these promises, he goes through these reminders and growing in the knowledge of God, we do this so that we can eliminate any cracks in our faith or understanding our theology again. So people cannot come in, right? So we have an enemy that won't come in. So we don't have a flesh, you know, sin nature that won't come in and try to expose that and use those cracks to their advantage. This is important. This is, this is good for us. Right? So this is how we start out. Again, it's a reminder. We just spent a chapter talking about what? False teachers, false gospels, right? And again, foolish people that follow them. Okay? He's probably kind of making that connection. If you're following false teachers and false gospels, you're full of wax. Okay? And so you need to check yourself. You need to make sure you, you are walking the way that God wants you to walk here, right? And so again, he gives them that reminder. Peter's always doing that. And then we see he's going to give them kind of the next thing to be aware of, right? Grow, you know, grow in knowledge, mature, produce fruit, watch out for false teachers, false gospels, foolish people, okay? And then there's going to be these people come, they're going to be scoffers, all right? What are scoffers scoffing at here? Verse 3, knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. Well, let's make sure you understand this. The people who are going to be saying what I'm about to say and scoffing and, 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 and coming in and, and, and producing these lies, they're doing it for themselves in their own lust. All right? But here's the topic that they bring up. Now, the reason you know, I have to believe that, that Peter would bring this up is this must be happening inside the church, must be an issue. All right? I mean, I read, these, uh, read this uh, initially and thought, well, okay, this is, you know, this is good. We talk about this and... Uh, obviously, Peter felt it was important. You know, is it still important today? You read through it at first, you might think, well, you know, maybe not, not, not so much. But as Peter begins to flesh it out and is beginning to think about it, and hopefully the Holy Spirit is leading you, I think this is maybe even a bigger problem today for us than it was back then. Because what are they scoffing at? What are they saying? Again, Peter wants their, the, the, the true believer's thought and, and, and heart and theology and all this to be whole and clean and pure and sincere. He says, but people are coming in. Here's kind of the, the cracks that they're trying to expose. Here's what they're saying. Where is the promise of his coming? Now, who's he talking about here? Jesus, right? What is, the Christian's, what is the Christian's greatest hope while they're here on this planet? Yeah, so, so Christ came. We had the first advent. We're celebrating that this, this season. He came. Right, and, and, and he died for our sins, and, and, and he made a way for us to be redeemed, and he returned back to the Father, and the promise was that he's coming back. And inside of that promise, right, inside of that promise is our hope that he will finish that redemptive process and take us home to be with him and the Father and the Spirit forever. And so to have hope that Christ is going to return, that this world is going to end, is paramount and foundational to a right understanding of who God is, his promises and his word, right? And who we are and, and how much we mean to him. He loves us so much, he came, but not only that, he's going to come again. 
to make sure that we are with him forever in eternity. How important is that? It's important, right? And so the false teachers here are looking to attack time, right? They said, listen, he said he was coming back, but, you know, by my watch, he's not here, right? Since the Father, since the foundation, things just keep, they just keep moving. They just kind of keep going on. Now, now why would we, why, why would this idea, this attacking of, of time, be such an issue inside the church? Why would Peter take time to address it? Begin to think about time, time in our own culture. Time is money. Time is valuable. Time is, time is important. Time is a means and a measure of control. Right? Amen. Right? Think about it this way. You go to work. You get a paycheck. The size of that paycheck is, is oftentimes determined by what? How many hours you work. They're going to pay you for a certain amount of time. If you want more money, you have to do what? you got to put more time in. Okay? I had a couple of doctor's appointments on, on Friday. Right? How many of you guys love going to doctor's appointments? Okay? Praise God. Okay? Got to get up. Got to drive 30 minutes. Got to wait in their office. Got to be there by 10 o'clock because my appointment's at 10 o'clock. And you know what that means. I will see the doctor sometime about <laughs> midnight. So, okay? Yeah. So, you know, it seems like their time is maybe more important than mine or so. I don't know. But I got to be there by 10. That's my appointment. Right? And then I had physical therapy. Got to be there by 11. Okay? That's my next appointment. And I have to pattern my life around their time. Okay? And even as we get older, but having lots of conversations, I, I don't feel like I'm old, but then I have conversations like this that go something like, you know, Christmas doesn't feel like it used to. Anyone ever say that? I had like three conversations just a year ago. When I was a kid, Christmas was fun. And we were like anticipating and excited and put the tree up and, and oh, what presents are we going to get? And I was like an adult and stuff. We're like, we got to figure out how to pay for presents. And someone's got to get in the shed and get that tree out, and it's probably going to be full of junk. And, you know, and so it's like time. Time changes us. And sometimes we kind of get a little jaded by that. As time marches on, we're kind of we're feeling worn out. I feel like time has kind of smacked us upside the back of the head, as it were. Time is powerful. Right? Time is money. Time is valuable. And if someone can come in and, and manipulate this concept of time, in our hearts and minds, they can gain power over us. And I think this is why Peter brings this up, because they come in and say, listen, you know, the Bible says that Jesus is coming back. Peter, Jesus, Paul, say these are the last days. When I think last days, I'm thinking days. How many days has it been? All right, 365 times 2,000, well, I don't know, do the math. All right. Now, they haven't been as far out, as far removed as we are. That's why I think maybe this even becomes a greater topic of concern. More so than, than originally when I first read it and go, well, I, I kind of get why this is important. But now think about it. It's been 2,000 years. Has anyone in this room ever had a thought that goes, maybe we misunderstood and maybe he's not coming back? Okay. Now, I'll admit, I've, I've sat in my office and kind of had that conversation like, maybe we got something wrong. Maybe we misunderstood because surely Jesus what? Surely he would have come back by now. Every generation that's gone before us has believed what? That Jesus would come in their lifetime. I'm not trying to discourage you this morning, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to show you how someone could come in and play off some of these doubts and fears. Because it hasn't happened yet, because in our estimation it should have already happened, we think something is wrong. See how that's dangerous? Anyone else see how that's dangerous? Anyone else maybe had some of these doubts and fears? It's just me up here rambling alone. I mean, I think about these things. And Peter is addressing, I, I love the astuteness of Peter. Peter knows that inside of his church, they're struggling with the same thing. Shouldn't Jesus be here by now? And people come in and go, you know what? Things are the same. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, all the same. There's a big giant word called uniformitarianism. Charles knows what that is, right? We've talked about that. Uniformitarianism, there's your word for the day, basically means things have always been how they always were and will continue to do so you know, in, 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 in finitum, right? Forever. 
that's kind of the, the idea here. That's what he says. Listen, from the fathers to now, tomorrow, nothing's changed. And when we live that way, where we stop and we take our focus off the return of Christ in eternity, and we begin to think about, well, okay, let's just think about today then. The things of today and the things of right now and the things of this world begin to become larger in our view as the things of Christ begin to become smaller. Time is money and time is valuable. And if someone can come in and they can get you spending more time in this world chasing things like money, but you say, listen, I gotta, I gotta go, I gotta work, I gotta get a house for my family and a nice car, and I gotta do these different things. Okay? If they can get you running around chasing earthly hobbies and habits, right? Even get you chasing just a good, simple church life. Okay, I'm gonna come on Sundays and sometimes on Wednesdays, and we'll do some fellowships and and I'll put my time in, my time in. Okay? If people begin to, to get your focus off the things of Christ, right? And in you know, a lot of ways tithing that time, investing that time for Christ, if they can say, listen, Christ isn't coming back. Just live your life. Right? Figure it out here and now. And I believe this is what Peter is trying to address inside the early church. And it's rampant today. What are you doing with your time? They say, listen, nothing's changed. And it's not going to change. So live your best life now. Figure it out now. Get what you can now. All right? Make sense of it now before you die. All right? Peter has something to say about that. And really, his, his rebuttal part of it comes before even he lays out what, 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 what the falsehood is here. Right? You go back and you look at your verse 2. Right? Talks about be mindful of what? The words. Talk about this idea of being sincere in that, having a pure mind, pure thoughts of the words. What words is he talking about? Uh, things that were spoken before with the holy prophets. When was Jesus' return spoken about? Is it a New Testament concept? It's not. I mean, it's in the New Testament, right? But where did the second coming of Christ come from? Where is it prophesied? Where, where is it given to us? It's actually coming from the Old Testament prophets. They told us a Messiah would come, a Messiah would die, right? a Messiah would redeem his people, and that Messiah would come back. This is an Old Testament concept. Peter says, yeah, it's in the Old Testament. The fathers knew it. The fathers talked about it. And here they say nothing's changed since the fathers. Well, let me give you some changes. It starts with creation. Genesis 1.1, right? In the beginning there was what? Everyone wants to quote like John 1.1, 1, 1, right? In the beginning was the word. Okay, it was there. The word was there, right? What was there in the beginning? Think about verse 2. Okay, the earth and the earth was how? In what condition, what state was the earth in? Verse 2. It was formless and, and it was void and without form. It was formless. Right? It says the spirit was hovering over the waters, the earth was not the earth we have today. Peter says, listen, there was the word and there was water in the beginning. And from that, God begins the, the creation process. Then we have you know, light. Then we have the firmaments being separated. Then we have land. Peter says things have not always been the way they are today. Then he talks about judgment again. He talks about Noah or, uh, and the flood again. Right? says there was a time when the world, and that word world there is for, for people, there was a time when the world was wiped out. Right? That's not how it is today. There was a cataclysmic flood. Do we have evidence and proof for a flood? Absolutely we do. Right? Peter says things have not always been the way they are. In fact, there's been momentous changes in the world that we live in. But the short-sighted Right? The, the, the narrow-viewed false teacher, scoffer, and if you're not careful, naive Christian would say, well, because I've never seen it, because it hasn't happened in America, because it hasn't happened in the last 500 years, it must not be happening. And Peter says, don't have that kind of view. The prophet said it. Christ said it. Right? He says, listen, I'm, I'm here as one who, who heard it as a witness myself. I'm going to say it. Christ is returning and because christ is returning our time spent for the kingdom is invaluable 
don't spend your time chasing after things that will fade and won't last. If Christ were to come back today, what would you have to offer him? The fruit of your time. He's not going to want your car. He's not going to want your house. He's not going to want your bank accounts. Right? He's going to want to know who you served and who you loved, who you shared the gospel with, who are you discipling, who are you mentoring. We watched a video in, in the men's dinner the other night, and, and even the guy said this, you know, I don't know if this is good theology, but when I get you know, to heaven, I stand before the Lord, and he says, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. He goes, I half expect him to look over my shoulder and say, who did you bring with you? I, I don't, I think that's something that we should consider, because that's the time that, that Peter and, and, and Christ is looking for us to invest in the life and the world that we live in. Yeah, you can take an extra day and, and go to work and make some extra money. Or you could take that extra day and you could go serve someone and love someone. Right? You could take a week and go on vacation. That's, that's good. You could take a week and you could go out of country on a mission trip and spread the gospel. Right? You could come to church a couple times a month. That's good enough. Or you can be here when the doors are open and when you're needed to serve and love people. And I know it takes energy and it takes effort. But then you have to come down and ask yourself this question. Where is my time best spent? And what is the most valuable use of the time that God has given me? Because time is money and time is valuable. It's best spent in the service of the Lord. Growing in him, growing in his knowledge, the application of wisdom. All right, you get to heaven, it doesn't matter how big a check you can write. It's going to matter what you did with the grace that God gave you to give to others. Time is hugely, hugely important, right? Don't let people cast doubt on, on your purpose here. Christ is coming back. You have a purpose to spread the gospel. Don't let them distract you, right? And if you're in a, a, a value struggle, know that you can never do anything more valuable with your time than to spend it serving the Lord. Right? It's kind of quiet in here. I want you to, hopefully you're processing that. Right? And this isn't Pastor Matt guilt trip wanting you to be up here and do more stuff. I mean, I do. But honestly and personally for you, how are you spending the most valuable, the most valuable resources God has given you, which is time? How are you spending that? Right? And if you stand before him, maybe he comes back today, you stand before him today, would you be proud to show him how you spent that time? Or have the scoffers put crackets in your theology and you're trying to cover it up as best you can so no one sees it. The truth is you don't spend your time wisely. There's so much to consider with this, this idea of time. But we've got to move on. Right? Time is valuable. Time is important. Right? I believe he's trying to tie that back to those false teachers, tie that back to growing in knowledge and maturity. But Peter's going to do something else for us. And I love this about Peter. Peter is not the guy that says, listen, here it is. Believe it. Don't ask questions. Right? Like a parent, when they say, do this, and you know, they're like, why? And you say, well, I told you so. Right? Why is it this way? Well, that's just how it is. You ever do that as a parent? I do that sometimes. Right? Don't ask questions. Just do it. Right? Why? Don't ask why. I told you so. Peter's not the one that just goes, well, here it is. Believe it or not. Right? Whatever. Do whatever you want with it. Blah. No. Peter's very practical. Peter's going to give us an explanation. Why has it seemed like it's taken so long for Christ to come back? Peter takes it as a valid question. And so Peter's actually going to answer that question in two parts. And I love Peter for doing this. And hopefully you'll find encouragement in this as well. Because not only is time valuable, and it is, a, I think, a valid question to ask, what's going on with Jesus coming back? Right? Why does it seem like it's taken so long? Right? Here's Peter's response to that. One, we have to understand that time is made. Okay, Time is created okay now we think of time as something that's beyond us is beyond our control it structures our day it structures our environment it structures our culture right we woke up this morning it was morning when we're done here it's going to be noon it's going to be lunchtime and it's going to be dinner and then it's going to be dark and then we're going to wake up and do it all over again and we just follow that pattern right we got numbers to measure it and all that good stuff and it seems again like it governs us but the truth is just like we are created, right, and God is our creator and has mastery over us, God is a creator of time and therefore has mastery over time. 
verse 8. It says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Anyone ever heard that verse before? Anyone ever quoted that verse before? Anyone ever use that verse as a proof text to make it mean something it doesn't? <laughs> Yeah, I do that. I remember I go back to this, oh, okay, so we can, we can take this verse and we can go to Revelation and we can try to make Revelation say something or whatever. And we use this verse a lot. It's a quote from a Psalms. It's in the Old Testament as well. We take that verse. Sometimes we try to blanket over certain things with it. I want to stay strictly within context of what I think Peter's trying to say here because he's talking about time. He's talking about our right understanding and focus of time. He's talking about how people can take time and try to use it like a tool or a weapon to control us. A lot of times time is what's keeping us running in circles. Then we don't take our time and use it as wisely as we should. He goes, here's what I want you to understand about time. While you're fretting and while you're waiting and while you're doubting, God has all that under control. Right? He does. Okay? Time to God is, is, is nothing. He is not linear. He is not stuck day to day. God is not going, well, I've got to wait. You know, in three months, I'll be able to do something because I have to wait on time. That's not God. Right? We, we get some indications from, from Scripture that God has seen time and interacts with time kind of all at once. Right? Now, the psalmist said that, that, that God had, that saw him knit together in his mother's womb. Then he also says in Psalm 139 that, that all the days ordained for him were already written in God's book. He's already seen them all. So, so while God is watching him be knit together, God has also seen the end of his days and knows how many days he's going to have. That means God has seen, is seeing, and sees everything that's happening all at once. Does that make sense? Good, because it doesn't make sense to me either. Because we live subjected to time. We're linear. To be able to say that I could be outside of time and see everything at once and know exactly what's going on and, and how it's working, that's only God. And why is it only God? Because God is a creator and author of time. So when we think, man, this has taken a long time for Jesus to get back. It's been 2,000 years. You know what? God's already seen this 2,000 years. He knows it in and out, frontwards and backwards. The days have been ordained. He's foreknown it all. In that 2,000 years for him, inside of his plan and purpose, which we're going to see the next answer from Peter, it's like a day. It's, it's like nothing. Because God is accomplishing something supremely important inside of what we see as time. Anyone else need like a brain break for a minute? Okay, think about that. We are subject to days passing, seconds, minutes Hours, days, all those things. It marches on. We can't stop it. But God is using it as a tool for his redemptive plan and purpose. And if it takes a thousand years or a day, it doesn't matter to him because his purpose and his plan is good and it's active and it's working. That even kind of goes back again and answers what he's already said. Why should we not believe the scoffers? Why do we need to keep a right understanding of time? Because even though it seems like things are taking a long time, they're not. God knows exactly what he is doing with the time that we've been given, the time this earth has been given, the time humanity has been given. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he's accomplishing again something great with it. We use phrases like time flies and, and wasted time and time waits for no man. That's not true with God. God's not wasting time. Time's not getting away from God as if he goes, oops, I let that go too long. Right? A day or a thousand years, a thousand years or a day inside of the redemptive plan of God and his control over time, he's got it. It's not for us to question. It's not for us to look at God and say, listen, let's get out of here or I got things to do or whatever. Right? The, the creation doesn't get to dictate to the creator just like time does not get to dictate to God. He created time. He's master of it. That all goes together with his second answer. And again, this one I think really ties all together, makes the most sense. Time is made, time is created. It, it is a tool used by God. I kept saying for his redemptive plan, and here it is. Time is 
mercy. Right? Verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Peter's speaking right to what some people are thinking, maybe without saying it. Maybe you've thought some of the same things. I, I know I have. Sure seems like God is taking his time. God is, in, in effect, what we're saying is God seems to be slack in doing what he said he was going to do. God seems like he's procrastinating. Procrastinating. There's another word for the day. All right? We're bad at procrastinating. Why do we think God's procrastinating? Because we procrastinate. Right? We project it onto God. Well, you know, that's something I should have done that a month ago, and I'm finally getting to it. And they're thinking, well, God should have, God should have sent Jesus back years ago. Peter says, God's not procrastinating. God is not slacking. God's not forgotten. God's not waiting too long. Remember Peter's whole goal, first part of chapter 3, he said it before, I want to bring you into remembrance. I want to bring you into a right mindset. I want you to be sincere in these things that when you think about time, you have the right understanding and the answer about why God is taking his time. I want you to know this. It's important. I want you to walk in this because it's going to allow you to endure the scoffers. Right? I think for some of us, hopefully maybe it'll even restore some of that hope and expectation that we have for him coming. God is not slack. God is not waiting. God is not forgotten, right? In fact, he says God is long-suffering. There's part of your answer right there. Why hasn't Jesus come back yet? Why do things seem like they just go on and on? Because God is long-suffering. What does long-suffering mean? It means exactly what it sounds like. He's putting up with us for a long time. You ever suffer with someone for a little bit? Okay. Some of you guys have patience and long-suffering. God bless you. Some of us, not as much. God's been putting up with humanity for a long time. But he has a reason and a plan and a purpose. He is long-suffering because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the fact that Christ has not returned, when Peter wrote this letter, the fact that Christ has not returned for his second coming, when we have this conversation today, it, it, it's a matter, it's a talk of mercy. God desires that all men would come to repentance, to come to know him. The reason that things go on and on is because there's more people that God desires to redeem and call his own and draw into heaven to spend eternity with him. Is that worth the wait, by the way? And I think of it this way, God waited for me. Right? By his mercy. He didn't cut things off and say, well, they're just on their own. I'm going to cut it off right here. I'm done. He waited for me. So can I wait patiently with him, through him, in him, as he draws more people to himself? I think I can. And when the scoffers say, well, he's not coming back, or God's word's not true, or, or this isn't right, he go, listen, he waited for me. Someone else needs to hear the truth of the gospel. There's someone else yet to be redeemed. And the proof of that is the fact that we are still here. God still saves souls. Amen. All right, if you're in this room and he saved yours, you should say amen. If he's in this room and you, and you desire to see other people come to know him, you should say amen. And as someone says, why are we here? What's the purpose? We are waiting and we are working and we are sharing the gospel of Christ so that more people would come to know him. Because there's someone out there still, even if it's just one more, that God foreknew. You know, those he foreknew, he also what? Predestined. There are those out there who are predestined to spend eternity with him because he knows they will submit their life to him and he's not willing to lose one of those. Now, it's interesting here, you see the word willing. It's the will of God that all men be saved. Shouldn't everyone just go to heaven and we'll be done with it? Right? Is the will of God immutable, unchangeable, unmovable? If God wills it, isn't it going to happen? If Peter is saying God is not willing that any be perished but all come to repentance, does that mean everyone's going to heaven? There's an idea out there that would say yes. There's another big word for the day, universalism. It says, hey, we're all going to end up in heaven one day. Don't worry about it. Some of us may come in a little 
little singed, right? I'm going to spend a few days in the fire, okay, smell like smoke. But we're all going to make it eventually. That's not what Peter is saying here. And I want us to make sure we understand this as well. In 1 Peter, Peter uses the word will, the will of God. And he's talking about it in terms of God, the will of God for you. He's talking to his audience here. Is that you would, that you would do good and, and live free and show respect for uh, authority and fear God and share the gospel. Right? And when he says that that's the will of God for you, that word will means it's, it's determined. You are to do that. Okay? There is no other alternative. The will of God, it's a command, it's an order, is that you would go and, and, and do these things, share the gospel, respect authority, do good, live free. That is immutable, unchangeable, and God has placed it upon every person who would call themselves a Christian. That is the command and order and will of God. And if you, if you work and walk against that, there's repercussions, right? You don't get to be going around the will of God inside the walk you claim to have with Christ, okay? But here it's a different word for will. The word will here means it's a desire or pleasure. Here's what I think Peter's getting at. Here, here's what I believe kind of the point of it is. In his mercy and his long suffering, God desires everyone. We're all his creation made in his image. He would desire, his pleasure would be that all people would know him and feel his love. And have a hopeful expectation for the return of Christ and spend their time glorifying him, walking in him, maturing in him, growing in him. He knows that's not going to happen. But he does know this, that there are some left. He foreknew them. He's predestined them. He's given them a purpose. So he's waiting for them. His desire is for those who would come to know him to come to know him. And so this world will roll on until all those people are gathered up. Is it one more day? Is it 2,000 more years? It doesn't matter inside the redemptive plan of God. A day in a thousand years, right? Peter already said that. What matters is that the mercy of God still calls out to people who need to know God, who need redemption, who need salvation. And he is long-suffering. He puts up with us for the purpose of more people coming to know him. And really, that, that, our answer inside that becomes, you know what? It's worth the wait. People come in and say, well, let's reinterpret the Bible. Let's come up with new answers. Let's do all this. Let's scoff. Let's, let's write books, whatever we want to do. And you say, no, 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 no. I'm content waiting, doing my part, growing in knowledge, again, maturing, sharing the gospel, avoiding false teachers, all these things Peter's talked about. I'm content to do my part, invest my time in the kingdom, and hope that I get to play a part in bringing another person into that redemptive and repentant and submissive relationship to God. That's how I want to spend my time. Time is not oppressive. Time is not evil. Time is a tool God uses to redeem lost souls. That's how we have to view it. And that's how we get to operate in it. We don't try to control it, right? You'll never stop time and you won't control it. Never, never were we meant to do that. That's God's job. But we can see it as God's plan and God's purpose for a lost and dying world. Amen? And I think that's, again, it seems maybe, maybe it seems simple, maybe not. But that word time, so critical, so important. And again, I, I want to encourage you to be thinking about evaluating your time, right? What's important? I, I was really encouraged yesterday. We, we, we had a group of guys get together and do some work uh, for a lady in our community. Had, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 guys show up on a Saturday morning when there was a football game on that some of us wanted to watch, right? And I know I'm not giving you a guilt trip if you weren't there, but here's what I was encouraged of. I, I saw guys there working that I don't normally see out working. I was encouraged. You know what? Who was even more encouraged? This this grandma who's now raising her, her grandbabies because of some, 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 some situations that, that we're going to pray for and God's going to work out. Who needs some things done that she couldn't do on her own to have 12 or 14 strange guys show up on a day that's usually ours, my time, to do work for her. It blessed her. Right? 
is, is that not some of the evaluations we have to make to go, what's more important? That I take an hour and, again, go do something over here for, my, for myself to make money, whatever it is, or I take that hour to go invest in the kingdom of God. Everything should be looking for investment. And you can invest in yourself, by the way. This isn't Pastor Matt saying, you know, if you take an hour to yourself, you're evil. No. Right? Even Jesus did what? He got away. He spent time alone. All right? That's good. That's healthy. But everything that Christ did, every hour spent, was according to the will and purpose of God. He spent time alone for what reason? What purpose? To prepare himself to go and do the things that God gave him to do. All right? And so every hour we have, every day we're given, we should be looking for an opportunity. How can I best use this for the kingdom of God? Knowing it's another opportunity. Time marches on. Yes, we can't stop it. That's okay. Because maybe that's the day that God's going to redeem another person. And that's what we're waiting on. Right? Maybe we'd get out of here sooner if we did our job better, Christians. I don't know. Let's go, let's go out there and share the gospel. People can hear this truth and hear the word and come to know him. But redeem the time. How are you using your time? What is your, your, your time most invested in? And if you stood before him this morning and you had to give him your log for this week, would you be proud of how you spent your time? Or would you be ashamed of how you spent your time? When your days are done and you get to heaven, what do you expect to hear from the mouth of our Father? And will there be anybody with you going, I'm, I'm with him? Right? I think about that. Quite a bet. And so if you would stand with me, we're going we're gonna to close it right there. We've got more to talk about in Second Peter. The goal is to finish it next week. Now Peter's going to talk a little bit more about that imminent return of Christ and our hope and our expectation for that. And it's good. We need to be reminded of that often. Again, it ties back to what we just talked about with time. And I want to encourage you this week. We've got holidays. Christmas is coming up. All those things are going to happen. Your, your schedules may look crazy. Don't let time dominate you. Don't let other people control you with time. Yes, you still have to go to work tomorrow. That's not what I'm saying, right? But as you go to work tomorrow, are you redeeming that time and using that time as opportunities for him? Are you being pushed around by time and just trying to survive? There's a difference. Remember, Peter wants you to grow. Grow and thrive, not just survive. And so even inside of this concept of time, how are we using it for him? He's in control of it. He made it. He's using it as a redemptive tool as part of his plan, and God is good. Amen? And it's worth waiting for. So, if you need me, I'd love to pray with you. I'm here. Let's just take a moment. Maybe the Holy Spirit, hopefully, is speaking to you right now, giving you some, uh, some, some wisdom, things to apply this week. Let's have a time of prayer, of response, and then we'll close the service and be done. Got a couple just quick announcements for you, and then we'll, we'll pray our way out of here. Um, for the rest of the day, uh, just in terms of services and meetings, nothing else is going on up here. I know this time of year is, is usually filled with family and events. Go and, and love them well. Again, redeem that time. Use that time as opportunities for the Lord. Our ladies do have their dinner tonight. They're meet up here at 6? 4 o'clock. You'd be late if you're here at 6. All right. So meet up here at 4 o'clock. Uh, dinner and the drive through nativity at the boys' ranch? Leaving at 4. So be here at like 3.30, right? Don't be that 
be the person that pulls in at 401 as the vans are like pulling out and they'll be waving at you, right? So uh, be here a little bit before that. They want to pull out four o'clock uh, dinner and then drive through nativity at the boys ranch. If you got questions about that, find Miss Vicky. Uh, again, you can take the church vans. Is it? Okay. We'll go make sure they're not full of things real quick before we leave. Okay. Uh, <laughs> except gas. We will make sure they're full of gas. Yeah. Thanks, Ms. Donna. That's a good reminder. All right. So uh, opportunity. Come fellowship. Go do that together. Great opportunity. Um, again, nothing else necessarily going on up here. Um, check your bulletin. I, I know coming up next Sunday we'll have our, our business meeting. The big discussion is going to be the budget. I've had a couple people ask some questions. Haven't had many people come up and talk to me about the budget. Uh, maybe hopefully you've been talking to the admin team or someone. Next year's budget is drastically different than this year's budget, all right? Not to air out, you know, too much of the church's business on a Sunday morning, but, you know, giving has steadily decreased over the second half of the year. So the budget has to reflect that as we go into 2020. And so things are being cut. Things are being shuffled around and moved around. And I want you to be in prayer for that. I want you to ask questions about that. I want you to be prepared uh, to discuss that. We'll have a meeting next Sunday morning after morning service. If you're a member, you can stick around and, and vote. If you're not going to be here and you'd like to vote, I think Amazai has already made the absentee balance, so you can vote uh, today if you need to. Uh, if you need a copy of that new projected budget for 2020, I don't think there's any copies on the, on the Welcome Center, so come find me or Amazai. We'll make you a copy. We want you to be informed. We want you to know. All right, it is different, and it, it means some things will be different for next year. Uh, another announcement we have is for the Christmas Adam service, right? Christmas Adam comes before Christmas Eve, and we're going to go out and serve on that Monday. But instead of going out in the afternoon because of food bank things, they filled up all those spots where we could reserve some. We're going to go in the morning. So we're going to probably meet up here about 8.30, 8.45 in the morning, okay? Leave here probably a little before 9, so we get out there by 9.30. We're going to go and, and, and pack boxes and help with the food bank and get all them squared away before Christmas comes. Uh, 9.30 to about noon, and then we're going to caravan over, go eat lunch at Bricktown. I've heard that during that week of Christmas, they're going to have, like, the trolley rides, and the, if the river stuff's going, if it's not too cold, I think that's all, like, half price or something. So we'll spend an hour or two hanging out down there, try to be back at the church, let everyone get back home by 2 or 3 o'clock, have the rest of your day to get ready for Christmas. But to me, great opportunity to serve, uh, you know, in, in inside of an organization that we partner with already uh, with our, our food pantry. So if you want to sign up for that, I think there's about six or seven spots still open. Uh, we need to sign up before next Sunday so we can confirm with food bank and get all our plans squared away. All right. Am I missing anything else? Any major announcements? Yes, so home group, you know, home groups are meeting on Sunday nights throughout the year. We haven't met, you know, for the last couple of weeks since Thanksgiving and things. We're going to have our friends miss for home group. Everyone's invited. It'll be at the Seal Coffs, right? Uh, so if you need directions, come find me, come find them. Uh, that's coming up next Sunday evening. Uh, bring a Christmas pickle. You guys remember the Christmas pickle, right? The ornament. Okay. Anyone have a Christmas pickle on their tree? All right, but he's got a Christmas pickle. All right, so bring an ugly ornament, uh, something to, to share as a gift. And then I think it'd be great that we adopt a little foster girl that we, we help the grandma work and do yard work for her, but zero to three months for girls, you know, diapers, anything like that uh, would be great. She's basically was handed a grandbaby and she has nothing. She's starting from scratch. So um, it'd be great for us to step in and take care of her. Uh, I think that would be a, a wonderful service opportunity. Uh, Ooh, okay. So that would be an early lunch, but to get to Guthrie, All right? So Guthrie, uh, ladies, luncheon at Guthrie Friday. Leave here at 9:30. Uh, ladies are doing a lot, but men, we had our, our dinner. Uh, hopefully, you, you, know, you were there. If you're not, you missed out on some great steaks. We had a steak dinner on Thursday night, and we'll be picking up our men's stuff coming up uh, next year. Mike's not here this morning. Uh, men's breakfast. How long are we doing men's breakfast? All right. Okay, men's breakfast is coming Saturday, 8 o'clock next door. So don't miss it on that, guys. There's an opportunity to fellowship and eat some food.
Yes, and this actually will be open here for voting. This is a, a polling place. Maps 4, I believe, is the vote, right? So Maps 4, if you're an Oklahoma City resident, which I am as well, uh, make sure you get out and vote. That's part of your civic duty. You know, Peter talks about that in First Peter. Go out, be a good citizen. You know, be involved. Go out and vote. Um, so there's an opportunity for that as well. Did I drop something? Mr. Glenn's coming up here with me. All right, anything else? Okay. Being bushwhacked. So listen, uh, I talked to Association Mike. I don't know if anybody ever even knew that or not. I don't I don't recall anybody doing anything to map the VAP. I don't necessarily go along with what the BCPA designates, but I do agree with that. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, it's come to my attention that his Matt's desk chair up there is wore out. Can hardly even nap in that thing. Yeah, it's so, so it's getting dangerous when I lean back. So so I'm just saying the next Sunday, bring money besides your tithe, and we'll take another offering and see if I can get him a new desk chair for Christmas and for appreciation for his uh, sharing the word with us every Sunday. So. Uh, uh, that would be much appreciated. Three, three, three uh, uh, that's, okay. Yeah, if, if we just want to go down to like Mathis Brothers and get a lazy boy, we'll just put that behind the desk <laughs> and reach the computer. I appreciate that, Mr. Glenn. You know, and it is, it's a pleasure, it's an honor uh, to be here to, to lead. It's a frightening thing to lead. I know I say this every year. I appreciate you guys letting me be here and grow in this. Uh, I love being a part of this family, and uh, we take care of each other. And again, it, it's a time thing. It's not a time constraint. We can show love and appreciation to each other when God lays in our heart to do so, which should be often. And so appreciate you guys. Love you guys. Uh, yeah, and if you want to get me a chair that's not falling apart, I will not say no because that chair's getting a little dicey upstairs. So I uh, appreciate that. Um, again, uh, if you need me for anything, I'm going to stick around right down here for a minute. If you got questions about the budget or anything that's going on, uh, you have you have freedom to ask me anything. You won't offend me. Uh, I, I want to make sure everyone's duly informed, has opportunity to ask those questions. Uh, again, everything open and honest and out there for everyone to see, right? No, no sleight of hand here. So uh, if you have opportunity to do that, a lot of things coming up, be involved. If you've got a question about anything in the bulletin, anything on the app, uh, it's for you. That's why it's out there. So ask, be a part of it. Love you guys. Thank you. Anything else before I stop rambling, close this in prayer? Coming up this Saturday, uh, I think it's going to be 11 to 1. Uh, the kids are going to be practicing for their skit on, on the Sunday before Christmas. So if your kids are involved with that, definitely be here. Kimmy is sick uh, this morning, so she is not here, unfortunately. But she will be here Saturday and next Sunday for their last practices. If you got questions, again, find me. be glad to answer those. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Again, appreciate you guys. And we'll wrap this service up and be done. Father, we love you. Then again, thank you for your word. I uh, thank you for an opportunity to be uh, amongst your people, Father. I thank you for those who have a heart to to hear and to know and to grow. I know Peter uh, was was thankful for those people, Father. He he was passionate about them. He writes these letters to those very people, uh, not wanting them to be led astray by anyone that would teach something false or try to convince them that uh, there's promises in chapter that God no longer cares. We know you care, Father. We know you love us. Time marches on because it's part of your redemptive plan. Father, we want to be a part of that as well. Help us to be ones that share the gospel, uh, to seek out those who need to know you, Father, that we would live our lives as a testimony, Father, and perhaps uh, be used by you, Father. So that should be our desire, to be used by you uh, to reach those who need to hear about your love and your redemption and your salvation. Father, I pray you'd give us that heart to redeem our time to do those things. I pray you bless these people. Uh, Father, bless all the events and things that are coming up. May we be used in a mighty way for you, Father. We love you. We thank you. So, in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.